Hello, my name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ. This is Light From Above. Glad you can watch our program. Today, I want you to think about this idea of normal, normal. And I gotta tell you, to me, you know, normal is just overrated. It's just overrated. I came across this list of words from uh, dictionary.com, article they published called Eight Pandemic Words or Phrases People Absolutely Never Want to Hear Again. And here's the words they have. New normal, <laughs> social distancing, unprecedented, uncertain, trying times, speaking moistly. I have no idea what that means. I think that's a Canadian term. Uh, toilet paper shortage. Oh, there you go. And essential. <sighs> you know, some of these terms, and there's others, we're hearing in this pandemic that we're going through right now, hopefully by the time you're watching this, that it's history. Hopefully. But right now, we're going through this stuff, and we're hearing all these terms and these phrases, and you know, it's all kinds of information out there. And I don't know about you, but you know, I listen to what the WHO, what the CDC says, and what, you know, what the president says, and what his experts say, and what the governor says, and, and his experts, a different you know, and I get to the point, I'm like, do any of them really know? Do any of them really know? And, you know uh, mass, yes, mass, no. You know, I mean, at some point, you sort of get to the point where you, you just stop listening. <laughs> get tired of it. It's a really difficult. And I, and I wanted to uh, mention churches and how they're trying to deal with this kind of situation. And I, I want to salute the leaders, whether it be the elders or whatever the membership's uh, leadership structure is, where they're at. I want to salute them for trying to keep people safe when they really don't necessarily know exactly what to do. Well, how could they? Because the government doesn't even know. I mean, they give you all this conflicting data. And you know, as a member, it could be really frustrating. Or as a citizen, it could be really aggravating. And it, you know, some people are very accommodative. They're, you know, and people make fun of them. Oh, look at those sheep. Or you know, some people can be, you know, they'll, they'll be really adamant and they'll make fun of people if, oh, you're just compliant. Or if you wear a mask, you might look at somebody and say, you, you don't care about the other person. Well, let me suggest something to you. The government is not omniscient. I know some people may think that it is, but it's not. And neither is the leadership at the local level of the church. But you know what? They, they care. They're trying to help people, right? I mean, some people, they try to say there's a big conspiracy about uh, wearing a, a surgical mask. I'm like, really? I mean, doctors and nurses, don't they wear that stuff all the time as a part of their job? I mean, what conspiracy could there possibly be? You know, our imagination get away from us. It's a difficult time. I know. I lost my mother in March. This is right before the pandemic was shutting things down. She passed away of MS. She didn't have COVID. I lost my father's two cousins. They died of COVID in two separate nursing facilities. They died a day apart, which I don't know how that works out. My son had to come home early from college because of COVID. Part of his semester was truncated off because of it. My daughter is of the class of 2020. Matter of fact, if you're part of the class of 2020, I hope you'll take a look at the episode I made for the class of 2020. She had her in-person graduation canceled. We're going to try to have a graduation party for her here in a few days, and you know, we've been waiting to try to get to a, re a position where we can do that. You know, people are having a hard time finding work. It's hard to find work. You imagine preachers that are looking for work. It's awful hard to interview congregations when they're not even meeting. Or companies that are deemed not essential, and so they have to close down. You know, I don't say these things to, uh, to build up your sympathy. I say them because I want you to know that I understand and that I care. I care about it. We need to remember that some of these terms, and they may grate on our nerves, 
And the circumstances may be just infuriating, perplexing. I don't even know. I mean, I can't tell you how many times uh, my wife and I would try to make a plan, and you know, a good plan, something good to do, like for our daughter. And she's wonderful. Our daughter's you know, very patient, a lot more patient than I am. And we wouldn't want to tell her. We got to where you know, we planned to take her to a Mongolian barbecue on uh, her 18th birthday, which was weeks ago. Because we couldn't do it because everything was shut down, right? And I was still afraid to tell her that we were making these plans. Waited till the last minute because I was afraid. I said, I'm not going to make a plan and have them change it. And then I have to disappoint her again, even though she would accept it gracefully as a father and a mother. You know, my wife, we did not want to put her through it. It's a difficult time. But we need to have patience. We need to remember that we will have times of crisis, as one person said, we are either going into a crisis, in a crisis, or coming out of a crisis. And crises are important. Why? Uh, because it's an opportunity for us to evaluate what is really important and what's not so important. The lesson we're going to talk about today is normal is overrated. Normal is overrated. And I picked probably a puzzling passage to some because there's a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about priority. But I picked Acts 27. Uh, and I don't have time to read it. I don't have that much time on the program. So I'd encourage you to read Acts 27, the whole chapter. And I'll just draw some lessons. And I'm going to start out with a rough journey, and then we'll talk about a divine warning and then a lightening of the load, and then our crisis we're talking about. A rough journey, looking at Acts 27, 1 through 8. Now, it's estimated as about 60 A.D. Paul has been taken to Rome. He has made his appeal to Caesar, and he has to go to Rome uh, for his court appearance. And traveling to Rome was long, and it was dangerous. It wasn't the Carnival Cruise Line. People died on these things. It was serious business. And it says, uh, talks about a feast there. And because of that feast, they think that, you know, it's in 9 through 12. It talks about a feast. And that leads people to think, okay, this is probably September, October time frame. Well, guess what? The sailing season was coming to an end. And it isn't like today, you know, where, you know, the, the body of water may be frozen over. And we might say, oh, you know, well, I guess we'll have to wait till spring. No, we'll get an icebreaker out there, and we'll have it go and break the ice, and then we'll grow right through it. Not that kind of stuff going on. When it was out of season, it was over. You had to wait. It's just too dangerous. They stayed close to the mainland of Turkey. And notice it says there in verses 1 through 8, they're, they're making strategic moves because the winds were contrary. They were contrary. You know, today, we wouldn't have to worry about that. No, if the wind's blowing against us, we just plow right through it. We have nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. You think they're worried about the wind? No, we'll just go right through Not then. If the winds were contrary and you're sailing on the sea, on the open sea like that, and you want to go that way, and the wind's going that way, if you go that way, your ship's going to be torn apart. So you go with the wind. It's dangerous. Very, very dangerous. They reached uh, the city of Myra in the province of Lycia, and they changed boats. They run into trouble at Sinaitis, decide to sail south of Crete for insulation. With difficulty, they make it to Fairhaven of Crete. So they made it this far, and it's really bad to be traveling. Looking at verses 9 through 12, it talks about the fast there, and that's why we think that the sailing season's really, it's a risky venture what they're doing. Notice in verse 10, the Apostle Paul warns them. This is the divine warning. In verse 10 of Acts 27, it says, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Well, the centurion, he goes and he talks to the ship owner and all that. And, you know, and they, you know what's the Apostle Paul know about sailing anyway? Uh, we're going to go ahead and go. So they go. They go. Verses 13 through 26, they run into a weather phenomenon 
that's called the Eurocyclodon or Euroquilo, or some people just translate it as a tempestuous headwind. They, they hit this storm that even has its own name. You know, like El Nino, you know, those kinds of things. They hit this storm, and you don't want to hit it. And if you hit it, you're in major trouble. It was a risk they took. And they're in serious danger. Incidentally, you know, you read through Acts 27, and you'll notice places that are mentioned and phenomena that are going on. And I want you to know that I want to read a little bit to you. This is from uh, Wayne Jackson's commentary on Acts, which is excellent. But he makes this note that I want you to pay attention to that was written by Philip Schaff. And he says in the commentary, Luke's account of the voyage and shipwreck of Paul, who he accompanied from Caesarea to Rome, has been minutely investigated by an experienced Scottish seaman, Commodore James Smith of Jordan Hill, and establishes the remarkable fact that Luke, though not a professional seaman, was close and accurate observer of the winds and storms, and he managed his management and movement of a ship, furnishes more information of ancient navigation in Acts 27, 28, than any single document of antiquity. Now, I want you to pay attention to that. Now, you may not read documents of antiquity, but you may have somebody say something like this. You know, the Bible is not historically accurate. Yeah, it, it makes all kinds of mistakes. And, you know, and if you compare it to other documents of, it, of the period, you'll see the Bible, eh, it's not even worth the paper it's printed on. You shouldn't pay attention to any of that. But, you know, this... This sailor went out, and he examined the terrain. He looked at it, and he said what Luke recorded was absolutely accurate. It was so accurate, minutely, that it was better than any record in antiquity. You pay attention to that when you have people who say the Bible is not historically or geographically accurate. They don't know what they're talking about. but you'll have people try to tell our young people that. Because if they can pick one little fallacy, false statement in the Bible, they'll try to throw the whole thing out. But this sailman, this sailor, he went out, found it's true. You know, Paul, they didn't listen to Paul. He was a teacher. He's in prison. They're going to listen to him. Luke was Luke. A navigation expert? I don't know, but his occupation was a physician. Who was helping these gentlemen with their knowledge? Well, God. Well, they go on. They had to reinforce the ship with cables. They had to throw tackle overboard. Now, I like to fish, and I, I'm not a you know I'm not a big game kind of fisher person. Um, I just like to sit out on a nice calm lake or a pond or something and you know and I have my little stand-up bobbers and hooks and I, you know I like sunfish and you know and if I get a fish bigger than my hand I'm like well that's great if I get one uh, bigger than me I'm like ah, that's you know forget it yeah I just not you know I like to fish but I'm I'm not after the big game so you know I can remember I was fishing in Macedonia Ohio and I caught a hold of this really big fish and I was like I was stunned and I saw it. It, ju it almost ripped the reel out of my hand, my rod and reel. And I looked at it. I'm like, wow, I could see, I could see my bobber. I could see my swivel. And, it, and that's the last time I ever saw that bobber. Why? Because he snapped it when he jumped. Last time I ever saw him. Gone. Well, you know, that bobber costs a couple bucks. We're not talking about that kind of tackle. This is not stuff you want to throw overboard. They had to throw other things of value overboard. Paul tells him in Acts 27, 21, he says, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. You know what Paul just told him? I told you so. I told you not to do it. You know, some people think it's rude to say, I told you so, but that's exactly what Paul's doing here. But he's not giving him a tongue lashing. You know, sometimes people say, I told you so, so they can beat him over the head because they didn't listen to him. And they want to beat him over the head because they didn't listen to him. That's not what Paul's doing. Paul is saying, you didn't listen to me. I warned you about this. 
Now I want you to pay attention to what I'm trying to tell you. That's what he's saying. And that parents, that's what we have to do with our children. You know, we have to, we, we have to point out, look, you know, this is what you should do. And they may or may not do it. And they may do the exact opposite. And they may run aground. They might make it. You know, there's more than way, you know, more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, <laughs> they might make it. But they may run aground. And they may come to you for help. And if you say, well, if you would have done what I told you to do in the first place, none of this would have ever happened. I wonder if they'll come back to you this ne next time. No, that's not what Paul's doing. And we shouldn't do that. No, we should point out to them, this is why I was telling you these things, which are really based on the Bible. And here's the principles that are involved that we've talked about. Hopefully you've talked to them about these principles, such as Proverbs. And now this is the trouble you're in, and I want to help you. And I want to try to help you with that. And so let me work with you to help you to get through this problem. See, that's what Paul's doing. It's not, he's not giving them a tongue lashing. He goes there in verse 22. You see it. Uh, and now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. You see, he said, you should have listened to me. Now listen to what I'm telling you. And, you know, and Paul, Paul didn't know of his own. He tells them that. He tells them in verse 23, an angel of the God whom I serve and belong told him. Well, you know, he wasn't a navigation expert. But an angel from God told him, don't do this. He had divine insight. They suffered shipwreck, but they survived because they listened to Paul. You know, now they're listening to him. You might say, well, we really didn't have any choice now, do we? I mean, they're in a real bad situation. They had to throw their tackle over. They had to re reinforce the ship with cables. They're scared. They, they, it says that they didn't see stars or the moon for many. You know what that means? In that time frame, that means they're lost, and they have no which way to go. They use stars and all that to get their navigation correct. They don't even have it. They had to have been terrified if they had any sense. Well, apparently they did. Because then they started listening to Paul. They suffered the shipwreck, but they survived because they listened. They suffered the loss of tackle and the ship. You know, I've got to tell you, the owner of that ship that's on that boat, he, he probably like, he's probably sad, sad. I lost my, I lost my boat. I lost my tackle i lost my little whatever you know and he might you know be and rightfully i'm not minimizing that but he might think but i'm so glad i'm alive because in the grand scheme of things me being alive is far more important than these things things that can be replaced or things that are not going to last forever anyway that is prioritization now I want you to think with me I want you to think you know about yourself about your situation I told you some of the things that I went through personally so I'm not trying to belittle I'm not trying to make light but I want you to think about this crisis that we're going through and I want you to give serious thought about your priorities, about the things you thought were so important. Think about the things you thought were so important a few months ago, and now it's like you don't even think about it anymore. Or, there's another one, I want you to think about the things that you were dismissive about, that you really didn't pay attention to a few months ago, but now they're so important, aren't they? You see, a crisis can help us re-examine to refocus, to retool, to reprioritize if we will do it. And that's what I want you to think about. Our nation is in a state of crisis, and not just pandemic. We have all kinds of challenges. We have borne losses. I, I have friends of mine, people I care about. They have lost loved ones who didn't even have the opportunity to say goodbye.
we have borne losses. As we're coming out of this crisis, at least we hope so, we need to weigh what is important going forward. So let me just ask you, do you really want to go back to normal? And do you really want to head towards what people call a new normal? Let me encourage you to think about pursuing excellence. Pursuing excellence. Don't chase after normal. Be excellent. Pursue that. You know what pursuing excellence means? That means you, you're not just going with the flow. Oh, whatever, when everything settles out, and oh, there's normal. No, pursue excellence. Prioritize. Think. Do we really want to go back to normal? Normal is so overrated. It really is. But I want you to think about some things that maybe we've taken for granted. So when this is over, we won't make that mistake again of taking them for granted. For example, fully appreciate being able to shake somebody's hand or to hug them, to embrace them. Can't do that now, can you? So when somebody, you know, you shake a person's hand, it's almost a trite thing. Now, if somebody shakes your hand, you, you realize they're putting me in danger. <laughs> and I'm putting them in danger. When this is over, fully appreciate that. Fully appreciate those who serve us. Police, EMTs, emergency room nurses and doctors and I mean, there's so many people serving us in the public and also in the church. Fully appreciate what they do, not just in times of pandemic, but all the time. Don't go back to normal. Pursue excellence. Uh, appreciate times of fellowship, of being together. I ate at Wendy's today with my son. All kinds of, you know, we're all kinds of people in there. There's a few people there, but couldn't talk to them because we're all wearing masks and we're all social distancing and, you know, and a smile sort of wasted with those masks and, yeah. It'd be nice to pull our, you know, pull our masks down and look at each other in the eye and see our facial expressions and be able to do that. See, don't go back. Don't take that stuff for granted. If you go to church services, go to all of them. It is, it is just infuriating, aggravating, demoralizing. It, I don't know how elders do it when they have to beg people to come to services, like on a Sunday night. I'm, talking about, I'm not even talking about the pandemic. I mean, people have tried all kinds of things to get people to come back to services. You know, we've done the small group things. You know, some people do that. Some people they have a different program. Sometimes they cancel the services. Sometimes <laughs> uh, pay them money. Well, they may not do that, but they may reward them somehow for coming. Really? Is that the pursuit of excellence? Fully appreciate being able to sing together as a congregation. It's probably the number one comment I hear from Christians. I really miss the singing, to be able to gather in a congregation to sing to one another. Don't take those things for granted. And there's others. The pandemic has given us the opportunity to realize that our life here is temporary. And we need to prioritize our life. Don't just settle for normal. Pursue excellence. Pursue excellence. Be the best that you can be. Think about the things of the past and ask yourself, do I really need this going forward or can I do better? Do better. Thanks for watching. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. 
Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood. And only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll free at 888-805-3390.